Hi, this is Tom Rhodes. Please join me as I scour the four corners of the earth to bring you interesting and intelligent, funny people who will enrich your life with wisdom and laughter. I'll take you to Europe, Australia, all over America. I might take you to the peaks of Machu Picchu, the canals of Amsterdam, the Great Wall of China, or the swamps of Florida, and certainly the many, many comedy clubs and comedy theaters all over the world. Come hang out with me and meet the many interesting people that pop up in my life as I travel the world as a stand-up comedian. You're listening to Tom Rhodes Radio. Karate kick, baby. Rock and roll. Well, hello, and welcome to Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. I have a wonderful, exciting episode for you today, all about Mark Twain and his worldwide comedy tour. I just finished reading this book by Richard Zacks called Chasing the Last Laugh, How Mark Twain Escaped Debt and Disgrace with a Round the World Comedy Tour. Uh, but before we kick in, I just want to say um, I'm speaking to you now from Las Vegas, I'm at m inside my room uh, at the MGM Grand, and, uh, you know, outside is human depravity of every form, uh, gambling, drugs, who knows what lascivious uh, activities and nefarious attitudes are lurking on the streets down below. And, uh, you know, I love Vegas because, you know, I used to avoid Vegas like the plague. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. My father always loved Vegas. I remember him dragging me here. And, um, you know, I was like a San Francisco snob for many years. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I had worth in my, um, I had a, I, I, I overly uh, self-worth attitudes towards my intelligence and really always looked down on Vegas. So... It's interesting that I've, I come here a few times a year now, and I'm, you know, somewhat sober. I don't drink alcohol anymore, and I'm not out running the streets like a wild dog anymore. So when I come to Vegas, basically, you know, I've got a little kitchen in my suite at the MGM. I went to the grocery store today, bought lots of vegetables, staying away from red meat, orders from Ashna, and... Um, you know, I exercise and I read books and basically uh, work on improving my life. So it's funny when I come to Vegas now, it's all a improve uh, my human condition rather than uh, like most people when they come to Las Vegas. It's to show the worst side of themselves. Um, and you can see that any night of the week on Las Vegas Boulevard, the Strip, and people with um, bachelorette party t-shirts and condoms pinned to their shirts and blah diddy blah diddy blah So I just finished this book this morning, and uh, I'm going to be reading to you today. When I met Rob from Philly in Singapore, that's what he told me he liked the most about Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp, that he doesn't have time to read and that uh, he loves when I talk about books. So, um, uh, and I want to thank my Patreon contributors. I did not put out an episode last week and um, probably would not have put out an episode this week if it was not for the handful of wonderful, loving human beings who contribute to this podcast um, every month. And those are the people that are keeping me motivated. And it's funny, I get emails from a lot of people who say, oh my God, I love your podcast. I listen to it all the time. And uh, I know they're not contributors. So <laughs> it's funny. So to the people who listen to my podcast regularly, who do not contribute anything to it, I just want to say... How many times can you eat free grapes at the supermarket and not buy a bunch of them? Just one little bushel. 
um, might help out the, um, the loving little hapless farmer who's growing the damn grapes for you. <clears throat> so, okay. I, before I, I start this episode talking about this wonderful book by Richard Zacks, uh, I pulled up a couple things on the internet. Um, first of all, I want to praise Mark Twain for a minute. Uh, in my opinion, Mark Twain invented stand-up comedy on October 2nd, 1866, when he gave a, a humorous lecture in San Francisco at McGuire's Academy of Music, and it was a lecture on the Sandwich Islands, which are today known as Hawaii. So uh, I credit Mark Twain with inventing stand-up comedy, what we know as stand-up comedy, and I've read that Mark Twain hated performing, and reading this book uh, confirmed it. He called it uh, platform speaking, or um, approaching the platform. He kept referring to it as the platform, getting on stage and being humorous. So let's just pay tribute to that wonderful night on October 2nd, 1866. Uh, it's the famous uh, advertisement that ran in uh, the newspaper. Let me read this little little blurb here. The trouble starts at 8. Few periods of Samuel Clemens's life. For those of you who don't know Mark Twain, that was his real name, of course. You know that because you're smart. You listen to Smart Camp. Of course you know that. Few periods of Samuel Clemens's life are as empty of detail as the time he spent in San Francisco. He lived there two years with mixed success as a local reporter. He would never set a story in the city, never return later in life, and never say the famous line, the coldest winter I ever spent was summer in San Francisco. But one important thing did happen here. Clemens walked onto a stage for the first time. The topic of his lecture was Hawaii, or the Sandwich Islands, as they were known at the time, where he had spent nearly half a year. For the first lecture, or stand-up comedy show, he was very nervous, so he made up a poster with these words along the bottom. Doors open at seven, half seven. The trouble will begin at eight. It was the beginning of a lifelong success for the performer known as Mark Twain. Okay, so this is the advertisement that ran in the San Francisco newspaper. McGuire's Academy of Music, The Sandwich Islands, Mark Twain, Honolulu correspondent of the Sacramento Union, will deliver a lecture on the Sandwich Islands at the Academy of Music on Tuesday evening, October 2nd, in which passing mention will be made of Harris, I think that was the president, Bishop Staley, the American missionaries, etc., the absurd customs and characteristics of the natives duly discussed and described. The great volcano of Kilauea will also receive proper attention. A splendid orchestra is in town, but has not been engaged. A den of ferocious wild beasts will be on exhibit in the next block. Magnificent fireworks we're in contemplation for the occasion, but the idea has been abandoned. A grand torchlight procession may be expected. In fact, the public are privileged to expect whatever they please. So it was a humorous advertisement. Um, uh, the, the night was a big success for him. I, I wanted to read this little thing to, to, to kick off. You know, it was his first stand-up comedy engagement his first lecture on the Sandwich Islands, uh, which it was about many topics that evening. It was very funny. It was very successful. But I love that it says, the great volcano of Kilauea will also receive proper attention. That is the volcano in Hawaii right now that just exploded, is bubbling with lava, and... Um, and earthquakes are tremoring all over the big island in Hawaii right now. I remember years ago on the road when I was young, 
a older comedian said to me, um, there was like a construction site and there was like big construction trucks. And the man said to me, no man can walk past a construction site without looking at it. It's something in our nature that just are, are captivated by um, uh, progress and, and things being built. And, and, and it's funny, like people say certain things to you and it sticks with you your whole life. Um, I've, whenever I see construction, I always think about me being a young man and this older man telling me that. I mean, it was his observation. Uh, and I just want to add to that that uh, no human being can look at bubbling, lo bubbling lava and not be completely jaw-dropping transfixed. Did you see it on the news? The, 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 the lava bubbling out of uh, the, the Kilauea mountain volcano? And going into those neighborhoods and like rolling over the street and like getting close to houses and stuff. It's pretty fascinating. Anyway, that's my tribute to lava. And I think lava and exploding volcanoes uh, beat the pants off of construction sites any day. Okay, kids. So um, let me have a little sip of water and uh, we'll start reading. Uh, Mark Twain, let me give you a little backstory for one of the greatest American writers of all time, he was a shitty investor. This guy invested a lot of money. He made a lot of money. Um, he bought a publishing company, and the publishing company published some of his books. <clears throat> There's a man's name, Bliss. I think it was the American publishing company who owned the rights to Mark Twain's first six books, which kind of impeded him from putting out a, um, uh, a body of work, uh, a, a complete works thing, which as an author, he could have made a lot of money off of, and it took years to negotiate that. But the thing, oh, and who else? They had printed the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant and also Pope Leo at the time. And Pope Leo was most famous for having his picture on a bottle of red wine that was laced with cocaine. Wow. Could you imagine? Man, you know, people, you think how more advanced we are with technologies and everything, but um, people must have been pretty happy in the 1890s walking around sipping on cocaine-laced wine with the Pope's picture on it. Oh, and the Pope Leo book sold no copies uh, the company was badly mismanaged. The U Ulysses S. Grant books sold pretty well, but um, that company was a flop. And then the biggest flop that really put Mark Twain in trouble, that he put all kinds of money into, <clears throat> was this page typewriter, page typesetter machine. He thought it was going to revolutionize the newspaper industry, where they had to... Uh, put each letter in place by hand, this new contraption uh, was supposed to make printing faster and uh, it had many parts to it. It broke down easily. Uh, it got ink all over the page. It, it was a complete disaster that Mark Twain lost his fortune on. And Mark Twain was married... He married this woman, Livy, Olivia. She was from Elmira, New York, which uh, Elmira, New York, it's an upstate. It, it plays a big part in his life because he keeps going back there. His wife was from like a, a well-to-do family. She, they, they had invested in railroads. The, the family owned a big portion of some railroad. So she grew up like kind of a snob. She didn't like his dirty jokes, and uh, she was always pushing him, you know, to be more serious-minded. And, uh, and, you know, he was grouchy. He had temper tantrums. Um, let me have a little sip of water. They bought a house <clears throat> after Mark Twain got money in Hartford, Connecticut. 
And it was a very wealthy place at the time. They lived on Farmington Avenue. They had three daughters, Clara. Oh, Jesus. Uh, it'll come up. Uh, Livy. No, Livy was the wife. Um, uh, Clara, Susie, and Jean. And uh, I'll tell you more about them in a minute. But here's a, th th this tells you. So, yeah, this is why I bring this up. Um, they did not live in their Hartford, Connecticut house for 12 years because he had gone bankrupt, Mark Twain, and Mark Twain's best friend was this guy named H.H. H. Rogers. He was one of the guys, one of the founders of Standard Oil. So he had a ton of cash, and um, uh, he couldn't, he had lots, they had, they had servants, they had a butler, they had a maid, and uh, a cook, and uh, a, a, guy, a carriage and horses and all these things at the Hartford house, all these rich friends of theirs, um, they were too ashamed to go live in their own house in Connecticut uh, because his snooty, snobbish wife, Livy, didn't want to face the wealthy neighbors that they had been bankrupted. And this is why I brought up H.H. H. Rogers. So he was a very successful businessman right when Mark Twain, right before he goes bankrupt, right before he's about to be sued by all of these creditors, H.H. H. Rogers advises him to shift the ownership of all of his copyrights for all of his books to his wife so that the creditors can't touch him. So there was, you know... Of course, the, the American press and newspapers, um, you know, uh, decried him as a turd for doing that. Um, but it, 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 it saved him from a life of poverty. But here's the thing that explains uh, his wife, Livy. The holy grail for Livy was to reunite the whole family in their wonderful home in Hartford with three daughters and seven servants and two horses and one carriage, and piles of cats and a laughing papa ringleading it all, papa being Mark Twain, of course. So let's, um, let's take a look at this fabulous book that Richard Zacks wrote. It's called Chasing the Last Laugh. So um, I think I've given you all the details. Uh, during this trek, Twain would perform 122 nights in 71 different cities in Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, and North America. He would spend 98 nights at sea on steamships and almost 50 days ill from coughs, colds, boils, and stomach illness. He would travel by rail, rickshaw, mule-drawn carriage, man-toted palanquin, an elephant, and his sightseeing boat would veer near floating corpses in the Ganges, and Zulus would do war dances for him. That's what's amazing. Not many people traveled. You know, he, as he, when he was a writer for the Sacramento Union, he spent six months in Hawaii, but also he went on this, a, stream, a steamship, journey around the world that he turned in his newspaper articles and that was his first travel book which was called Innocence Abroad which uh, it made him a lot of money it was very funny everyone loved it and then you know he goes broke from these bad investments and basically you know so he went bankrupt which you know by American law Okay, he's free from his debts now. So his snobby wife, Livy, had this real, like, noble, chivalrous uh, attitude about honor, and she felt ashamed. Like, this woman couldn't face her neighbors because they had gone bankrupt. So they still own this huge house in Hartford, and they can't even live in it. Uh, but it was her, her dream and desires that Mark Twain pay back every cent that he owed to the creditors, 
which, you know, in in today's money is 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 he probably owed probably like four or five million dollars, which he I think he he owned he owed it was a, a couple hundred thousand dollars something like that that uh, an astronomical sum, uh, and and he had this burden and this shame that they carried. Uh, he, he had a real tragic life. His with it, with his daughters and uh, I'm going to tell you the whole story and now. Uh, do, do, do. The famous author had turned 60 years old and had already written Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. He had envisioned himself more in the role of lazy literary lion than as a platform joke teller. Hey, watch it. That's what I do for a living. He had also expected to be basking in the Rockefeller-style wealth, not trying to shovel his way out from shame. Okay, so fascinating book. I'm going to read you some highlights. We will skip around. So he does this. Uh, it's the only way he can get out of debt. Uh, and he booked this tour across. Oh, and he had to stay out of, of New York State because uh, there was like two or three creditors that wouldn't forgive the debt from the bankruptcy that pursued him ruthlessly. And right at the last minute, he's, he wants to do this warm-up tour. Uh, I think he, he started in like Cleveland and then went to Chicago. Then he performed in, in Montana and then uh, Portland, Olympia, Seattle, Vancouver. And then from Vancouver, he took a steamship to Sydney, Australia. So uh, this, okay, so who is this? This is his daughter. Fortunately, his daughters, everybody kept diaries back then. But it's like they didn't like that he was known as this funny guy. They wanted him to be known for being uh, this serious, respected author. So, which daughter says this, man? Okay, Clara. She also, like her mother and both of her sisters hoped that Papa would be hailed as a serious writer. He planned to resume writing his next book, Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc, that year. Uh, I have the Joan of Arc book. I bought it years ago. I think I got four pages in and fell asleep. Um, and it's notably his most serious book. Okay, so this is from Clara's Diary. How I hate that name Mark Twain. I should like never to hear it again. My father should not be satisfied with it. He should not be known by it. He should show himself the great writer that he is, not merely a funny man. Funny, that's all the people see in him, a maker of funny speeches. Yeah, you little bitch. That money, that funny money's paying for your singing lessons and your whatever. Okay, all right. I'll try not to take things personal. It wasn't my family. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Livy uh, was his wife. Livy had grown up in the rarefied atmosphere of the mansion of Jervis Langdon. He was a teetotaler. That means he didn't drink. Pious. That means he was very religious. A non-smoker. That means he didn't... Okay. A non-blasphemer... A staunch abolitionist, he was against slavery, who personally helped slaves escape via the Underground Railroad. Cool. She never once witnessed her father's predatory practices that forced rival coal transporters out of business. Livy had a very idealized view of business conduct, and she would firmly hold her husband to it. Yeah, that was it. So her family had invested in uh, railroads that transported coal. So that's where they made their money. Uh, so I think I've painted the picture pretty well. Uh, that uh, They're in dire straits. Can you hear the pages turning on the book? Okay. The tree. Okay, so I guess they're getting ready to go on this 
Yeah, so he's preparing for the world tour. Uh, and they're about to set off across the United States by rail. The trio went to Penn Station and boarded the train to Elmira. Twain began filling his notebooks with possible selections for his performances. Pond, that was the tour manager, or the guy who set up the tour, offered to set up a trip for one-third of the profits. Twain countered with one quarter, and Pond accepted. The author was especially optimistic about San Francisco, and he hoped to do two consecutive nights in many places to allow Livy to rest. He wanted to charge $1 for general admission, $1.50 for reserved seats, and keep it intimate by never playing in theaters holding more than 1,500 people. Also, he wanted at least nine nights of practice before captive audiences such as at the Elmira Reformatory and Blackwell's Island's House of Refuge. Okay. Well. Deadpan humor is dangerous. He never laughed. And he loathed performers who chuckled or guffawed at their own material to highlight funny bits all of which is very depressing and makes one want to renounce joking and lead a better life. But Twain wanted a theme to string the half dozen stories together. This is he's getting everything prepared. So as to, vo to avoid jagged non sequitur leaps to new topics, he came up with morals. He was going to write, he was going to connect the connective tissue to all the stories he was going to tell was going to be based on morals. Wilder also revealed that Twain's blacklist, backlist, that's his, his books that he had written, generated only about $1,500 a year, and that most of his royalties for the past decade had been swallowed up by Webster. That was the publishing company. And, uh, that he invested in and plowed back into the company. He told the world, oh, so Wilder is the, one of the lawyers who's going after Twain's ass. He told the world that Twain would have been a wealthy man if he hadn't invested in the Page typesetter and Webster Publishing. The lawyer waved Twain's dirty laundry like a flag. Wilder's final off-the-cuff insult came in sharing that at the end of the session, Twain had offered to sign any legal documents without reading them. Wilder hoped the courts would reverse the transfer and put a lien on Twain's copyrights. Yeah, so when he transferred the ownership, so this guy, they, they, there was some of the lawyers, he fucked a lot of people. They weren't having it. Twain had several pet peeves about performing. Start on time. No stragglers. Do only 90 minutes. Receive no introduction and tolerate no musical acts. Okay, so this, now he's in Cleveland. This is the first night of the tour. No one had told him that a couple of attractive young newlyweds, Fiora Dresser, Dresher, and Dewey Haywood would open the night show by performing chamber music. He on the flute and she, a glamorous brunette, on a 100-year-old violin, and that the wedding party of 250 would clap them to several encores. No one had told him to expect a 45-minute delay. It's funny, you know, probably for the rest of those people's lives, their big story was, we opened for Mark Twain, man. And he's in the back seething. Also, no one had told him that since this Monday night performance served as a benefit for underpaid, overworked newsboys, 500 of them, ages 6 to 16, would be seated in bleachers on the stage behind him. Wow. When the newlyweds finally finished, he hobbled out alone. He later explained his reasons for avoiding local amateur MCs who overpraised him in a jumble of vulgar compliments and dreary effort to be funny. Twain had even tried planting an introducer in the audience. A big hulking man would reluctantly come up and stand there, dumbfounded, then say, I don't know anything about this man. At least I know 
only two things. One is, he hasn't been in the penitentiary. And the other is, after a long pause, and almost sadly, I don't know why. <laughs> Twain obviously wrote that joke for the guy to say, this guy hasn't been in the penitentiary. I don't know why. Finally, Twain just discarded introductions altogether. That debut night in Cleveland, he reached the middle of the stage and the perspiring, fan-waggling, handkerchief-mopping audience greeted him with enthusiastic applause, as did the newsboys behind him. He launched right into it. I was solicited to go around the world on a lecture tour by a man in Australia. I asked him what they wanted to be lectured on. He wrote back that those people were very coarse and serious and that they would like something solid, something in the way of education something gigantic, and he proposed that I prepare about three or four lectures, at any rate, on just morals. I should like to teach morals to those people. I do not like to have them taught to me. Later, he would abandon, uh, he would abandon the, uh, the morals thing and realize that he's Mark Twain, he's a badass, and that he can go from story to story. You know, he really fine-tuned his show the way a comedian should. He, he would drop sentences. He would, uh, he, he would try and punch things up uh, and um, deliver the good. So, okay, so this is him going across America. Livy had some choice advice for her husband. Oh, this is great. This is a really good... Uh, she seems like a snooty bitch, but... She does give him this great advice that turns out to be the best advice for his whole tour with the exception of uh, when he goes to South Africa. Um, he ends up dropping this story. But uh, here it is. This is, this, is, this is great wife advice. Livy had some choice advice for her husband. Make it less funny. Give the audience a chance to catch its breath. Never a champion of his vaudeville tendencies. She now wanted him to show off his narrative talents. Lesser men could tell that christening joke, she suggested that he inserted at least one long, moving, emotional story into his program. Maybe Huck Finn and runaway slave Jim on the raft floating down the Mississippi. He could build to the key scene when the poor, uneducated white boy, the hooligan son of the town drunk, apologizes, I'm sorry, agonizes over whether to do what everyone in Hannibal tells him is the right thing to do. That is, to hand over his best friend, Jim, to, sla to the slave catchers. Huck, in that moment, must decide whether to ignore his heart and obey the community conscience and the laws of the slave state of Missouri. It is immensely powerful in the midst of, of a novel, but would it work as a 20-minute monologue? Twain was skeptical, but he took her advice in Minneapolis, the sixth stop on the tour, and that Huck and Jim story would prove far and away the most popular of his round-the-world repertoire, singled out by critics and audiences from North America to New Zealand, to India. Yeah, so uh, that was the the thing. So Huck Finn, I, oh, yeah, here it is. Why, I, why would I tell you when it's right here? Now Twain followed Livy's advice. Even though his comedy was flourishing, he sought the downbeat and told Tom and Huck. He needed an adept introduction to place listeners who hadn't read the book smack in the middle of the drama. Here we go. And that brings me by the same process which I am following right along. Regular sequence morally. And to an incident which made a great deal of stir at the time when I was a boy down there in Hannibal. A sort of thing which you cannot very well understand now. That was the loyalty of everybody, rich and poor, down there in the South, to the institution of slavery. I remember Huck Finn, 
a boy who I knew very well, a common drunkard son, absolutely without education, but with plenty of liberty, more liberty than we had, didn't have to go to school or Sunday school or change his clothes during the life of the clothes, and we preferred to associate with him because we envied him. Even Huck Finn recognized and subscribed to the common feeling that of that community, that it was a shame, that it was a humiliation, that it was a dishonor for any man when a Negro was escaping from slavery. It was his duty to go and give up that Negro. It shows what you can do with a conscience. You can train it in any direction you want to. I have written about that in a story where Huck Finn runs away from his brutal father. And at the same time, the slave Jim runs away from his mistress, his owner, because he finds she is going to sell him down the river. And they meet by accident on a wooded, wooded island and they catch a piece of raft that is adrift and they travel on that at night, hiding in the daytime, and they float down the Mississippi. Now Twain needed to act out the scenes on the raft. He had marked up his own copy of Huck Finn, crossing out words, adding underlines for emphasis, and colloquial bridges. He even marked when to blubber or to bellow. So he described how Huck and Jim were approaching the free town of Cairo, Illinois. But Huck's conscience was troubling him. That was where it pinched. Conscious says to me, what had poor Miss Watson done to you that you could see her N-word go off right under your eyes and never say one single word? What did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean? Why, she tried to learn you your book. She tried to learn you your manners. She tried to learn you to be a Christian. She tried to be good to you every way she knowed how. That's what she done. I got to feeling so mean and treacherous and miserable. I wished I was dead. Then Twain described how Jim made Huck feel even worse because he told him that when he was free, that if he couldn't buy his children, he'd get an abolitionist to go steal them. It, mo it most froze me to hear such talk. It was awful to hear it. He wouldn't even dared to talk such talk in his life before. Here was this N-word, which I had as good as helped to run away, come right out flat-footed and saying he would steal his children. The children didn't belong to him at all. The children belonged to a man I didn't even know, a man that hadn't ever done me no harm. Huck is torn and goes off in a canoe, maybe to tell on Jim. But as he's paddling away, he hears the runaway slave yell, Duh, you goes, there you goes, the old true Huck, the only white gentleman that ever kept his promised old Jim. Oh, when he said that, it kind of broke me all up. Then Huck runs into a boat full of slave catchers, and one asks him, What's that yonder? A piece of raft, I says. Do you belong on it? Yes, sir. Any men on it? Only one, sir. Well, there's five N-words run off tonight up yonder. Above the head of the bend. Is your man white or black? I tried to say he was black, but the words wouldn't come. They hung fire, and I seemed to hear that voice. I did not hear it at all. But it seemed just as natural as anything in the world. That voice is saying, You true, Huck. You only friend left, Jim, now. There was my conscience tugging after me all the time. It kept saying that anybody that does wrong goes to the bad place. Hell. It made me shiver, and then I says, I don't care anything about it. I'll go to the bad place. I will take my chances. I ain't going to give Jim up. And then I says... The man on the raft is white. And then he says, It took you a good while to make up your mind what color he is. I reckon we'll go and see what color he is. I, I reckon we'll go and see what his color is. Twain has been acting out the voices, the boy, the slave, the men. 
The Minneapolis auditorium was dead silent, waiting. He slips back into Huck's voice. Well, I was up on a stump, I got to lie, just in ordinary circumstances. Truth is all right, but when you get in a close place, you can't depend on it at all. So I had an idea, and I says, it's Pap, and he is sick, and so is Mary Jane, and the baby and Pap will be powerful thankful, for you will help me tow the raft ashore. I have told everybody before, and they have just gone away and left us. He sa- And he says, that's mighty mean. And the other says, mighty bad, too. What is the matter with your father? He's all right. It ain't catching. Set her back, John. Keep away, boy. Keep to leeward. Confound, I just expect the wind has blowed it to us. Your pap's got the smallpox, and you know it precious well. Why didn't you come out and say so? Do you want to spread it all over? Goodbye, boy. You put 20 miles between us just as quick as you can. You will find a town down river. Tell them the family have got the chills and fever. Everybody got that down there. Don't you tell them they have the smallpox. Goodbye, boy. Goodbye, sir, says I. I won't let no runaway N-words get by me if I can help it. The audience applauded, and over time, as Twain realized the power of the story, he explained it and acted out Huck blubbering, begging the men to come help his sick family, all to make the lie more convincing. And he would also work on sharing the moral while trying to sound, while trying not to sound preachy. He would refine the introduction to include this pithy phrase. In a crucial moral emergency, a sound heart is a safer guide than an ill-trained conscience. Reread that line. This is what the author just said. In a crucial moral emergency, a sound heart is a safer guide than an ill-trained conscience. Reread that line. No, I just did. Somehow, this concept seems to go to the essence of all Mark Twain's writings and beliefs. Forget the conventional wisdom, the current laws or religious teachings. Try to follow the sound heart of a boy or a youngster. He writes a letter, Mark Twain... And he says, I am getting into good platform condition at last. He's talking about comedy performing. So his daughters, let's talk about his daughters for a second. Clara was the oldest. She was vivacious, mischievous, and at times flirtatious. She was far more comfortable in her own skin than her sisters. Susie mooned about, plagued by self-doubt, and Jean raged. Clara played the piano and sang and collected admirers. The youngest daughter, Jean, has epilepsy, and uh, that's another heartbreak coming up later in the man's life. Okay, so, where's he at now? Washington? Seattle? Um, he had a nephew working for the San Francisco Examiner. Uh, so he was supposed to do a supposed to do an interview that would be put out on the wire and go to newspapers all over the country and all over the world. And then he decides uh, he's going to write it out and sit. So this is what he writes. Never mind interviewing me. I've nothing to do. Lend me your pencil and let me say it myself. What am I lecturing around the world for? Your question is easily answered. It is for the benefit of the creditors of the wrecked firms of Charles L. Webster and Company. I furnished the capital for that concern. It made a fortune the first year and wasted it in the second. After that, it it began to accumulate debts and keep this industry diligently up until the collapse came. That was the great financial collapse of 1893 when all kinds of um, the stock market crashed, everybody lost their fortune, 
uh, and uh, businesses went bankrupt and people were ruined all over uh, the country. So you always hear about the stock market crash of 1929, but there was uh, a big financial crash in 1893. And that's where uh, a lot of Mark Twain's investments went into the toilet. My wife and I tried our best to save it. We emptied money down that bottomless hole as long as we had a penny left, but the effort went for nothing. When the crash came, the firm owed my wife almost as much as it owed all the other creditors put together. By the advice of friends, I turned over to her my copyrights. She releasing the firm and taking this perishable property in full settlement for her claim. Property not worth more than half the sum owing to her. She wanted to turn her house in too and leave herself and her children shelterless, but she hadn't a friend who would listen to that for a moment. And I can say, with what is perhaps a pardonable pride and satisfaction, that there is not a single creditor who would be willing to let her do it. No, I am mistaken. I am forgetting one creditor, a printer, the, the ruined firm owed him about $5,000. He had made a neat little fortune out of Webster and Company, but that didn't signify. He wanted his money. He could not wait on my slow earnings, so he persecuted me with the law. No, I must not say anything more about that creditor just now. I will wait till I get time and room. As I understand it, your journal's Usual issue contains only 16 pages. I earned a good deal of money last year. I have left it all in New York. This money, added to the assets of our defunct firm, will pay off one half of the firm's debts. A month ago, I supposed it would, be a, it, it would take me a dreary long time to earn the other half, but my eyes have been opened by this lecture trip across the continent. I find I have 25 friends in America where I thought I only had one. Look at that house in Cleveland in the dead middle of July with the mercury trying to crawl out of the top of the thermometer. That multitude has repeated itself in every big town clear across to the Pacific. I shall be 60 years old in November. A month ago, it grieved me to be under this load of debt at my time of life but that feeling is all gone now. Such a burden is a benefaction, a prize in the lottery of life. When it lifts a curtain and shows you a con continental spread of personal friends where you had supposed you had merely a good sprinkling of folks friendly to your books, but not particularly concerned about their author. Consider we fill the galleries of the opera house to hear a lecture. I think that that is a compliment, worth being in debt for. The other day in Montana, a stranger sent me this word. You can draw on me for $5 a day till you are out of debt. When our firm broke, Pulteney Bigelow mailed me his check for $1,000 and didn't want to take it back again. Douglas Taylor, printer, New York, said, draw on me for $1,000. If you think you can't find a hundred men to do the like. Make me a bet and you will see. One dollar bills came in letters from here and there and yonder, from strangers, and I had to send them back. And so, let me sound my horn. It doesn't do you any harm, and I like the music of it. Properly, one third of our dead firm's debts should be paid by my partner, but he has no resources. This is why I must repay them all. If I have time and health, I can do it, and I think the creditors have confidence in me. My wife and children are not troubled. They never knew anything about scrimping before, but they have learned it now. They know all about it these last two years, and what murmuring is done I do, not they. My books, several of them, are in the hands of my pioneer publishers, the American Publishing Company of Hartford. All of the others are in the hands of the Harpers. The Harpers will begin to issue them from new plates presently. The books will help pay the Webster debts. I turn them over to my wife to keep them from scattering, which would, of course, destroy their earning capacity. 
but she will touch none of the profit that can be spared to the creditor. My trip means a year's lecturing all around the world, and there, after a lecture trip all over the United States. Now that I reflect, perhaps it is a little immodest for me to talk about my paying my debts, when by my own confession, I am blandly getting ready to unload them onto the whole English-speaking world. I didn't think of that. Well, no matter, so long as they get paid. Lecturing is gymnastics, chest expander, medicine, mind healer, blues destroyer, all in one. I am twice as well as I was when I was started out. I have gained 9 pounds in 28 days and expect to weigh 600 pounds before January. I haven't had a blue day in all the 28. My wife and daughter are accumulating health and the strange and the strength and flesh nearly as fast as I am. When we reach home a year hence, I think we can exhibit as freaks. Okay, so um, that's the interview that he wrote himself, uh, which reminds me of a couple of important details. Uh, a few people sent in money, but he wasn't getting dollars in the mail, like he said. Um, they were broke, and he, so he mentioned them scrimping. The whole trip... They're staying at the most expensive hotels all over the world. They're traveling first class. Uh, you know, he, he liked to drink war, uh, hot scotch at night. He smoked like 12 cigars a day. Uh, they, they, you know, as broke as they were in, in financial straits, they're still living lavishly. And another curious footnote is they only took one of their daughters with them on this trip. Uh, Susie, so say they took Clara, and Clara was, I guess, by every measure, the favorite. She was bright, effervescent. Uh, it, 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 it never mentions, I mean, it just mentions that a lot of guys liked her. And she took piano lessons and voice lessons. And uh, Susie, who had a lot of self-doubt, she chose to stay in Elmira, New York, with Livy's family, her sister and brother, who lived there, uh, because she had a crush on a local boy who lived there. And she couldn't imagine being away from him for a year. And then Jean, who had epilepsy, and they're trying to get her, you know, in the 1890s, nobody knew how to treat it. There were all kinds of doctors with, like, uh, miracle. You know, they said they could, they could cure it. And uh, they spent a, a vast fortune treating their daughter Jean. And, uh, and, and, you know, they didn't know how to deal with somebody who went into epileptic seizures in public or wherever. So I guess to a certain degree, they, they try to keep her tucked away or whatever. So it's, um, it's uh, a, a choice that will come back and haunt them that they only took one of their daughters. And you will find that out later in the book. Okay, separation. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, yeah, so before they left, Twain stuck in bed, but smoking constantly, found time... Okay, this is when they're in Vancouver. This is before they're about to shove off and leave North America. Twain stuck in bed, but smoking, smoking constantly, found time to write a letter to young... Rutyard Kipling, with whom he had struck up a passionate friendship, with a handful of meetings and lots of mutual admiration. Kipling, at age 24, just before he struck fame for his tales of India, had made a pilgrimage to Elmira, New York, to seek out his favorite American author. Twain had graciously welcomed the young, unknown Brit, 
and the pair smoked cigars, and Twain talked for hours, fitting to many subjects, but especially the role of conscience. Twain was always obsessed with that topic. In his personal life, he vacillated between doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing, such as swearing, lying, drinking, gambling, envying, bad-mouthing, just as his fictional characters vacillated too. <coughs> From Tom Sawyer convincing his friends to whitewash that fence, to Huck on the raft, torn over defying conventional wisdom to protect a runaway slave Jim. Uh, sorry, my nose is getting locked up. This uh, Las Vegas air is terrible. Kipling, in a later article, recounted the gist of Twain's opinion. Your conscience is a nuisance. A conscience is like a child. If you pet it and play with it and let it have everything at once, it becomes spoiled and intrudes on all of your amusements and most of your griefs. Twain bragged back in 1890 that he thought he had come close to killing off his conscience. Clearly, his recent debts and Livy had helped resurrect it. Thanks, Livy. Okay, so now they're at sea, they're journeying. <clears throat> so they... He was excited to stop in Hawaii on his way to Australia, but there had been a outbreak of smallpox and malaria and things like that. So it was frustrating that he did not get to go back to, um, you know, his writings about Hawaii and the lecture. Uh, it was in the book Innocence Abroad, uh, as well as uh, his other travel writings, uh, helped make him famous. So, uh, Twain had returned from Hawaii in August 1866, and soon afterwards gave his first lecture series. His clever ad proclaimed a splendid orchestra is in town but has not been engaged. A den of ferocious wild beasts will be on exhibition in the next block. Magnificent fireworks were in contemplation, but the idea has been abandoned. He capped it off with, doors open at seven, the trouble begins at eight. Not only was it his first big soloist payday, but it gave him an instant reputation as one of the funnier men in the country, a Pacific Slope humorist, from nobody to almost somebody by telling cannibal jokes. In other cities, I usually illustrate cannibalism on, on the stage, but being a stranger here, I don't feel at liberty to ask favors. But still, if anyone in the audience would lend me an infant, I will go on with the show. <laughs> You could see that killing. Of course, his stand-up amounted to far more than cheap jokes. He showed a casualness, an informality that stood out in that booming melodramatic Victorian era. The audience had no idea this in, that this informality resulted from intense practice. Also, his material was darker and more intelligent than mere jokes. As an example, when these islands were discovered, the population was about 400,000. But the white man came and brought various complicated diseases and education and civilization and all sorts of calamities. And consequently, the population began to drop off with, a, with commendable activity. Forty years ago, they were reduced to 60,000 and the educational and civilizing facilities being increased. They dwindled down to 55,000, and it is proposed to send a few more missionaries and finish them. The Hawaiian or Sandwich Islands were still independent in 1895 when, when Twain was set to arrive. Sanford Dole of the Sugarcane Pineapple Empire had staged a coup and overthrown the Hawaiian monarchy and created a republic that wouldn't be annexed by the United States until 1898, 
in the jingoistic wake of the Spanish-American War. Wow. So think about that the next time you're eating a pineapple. That uh, they overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy. Uh, the captain of one offloaded vessel, very fat man, struggled aboard. Clara took his photo, and her father bravely shook his hand. The encounter made the papers, and Clara was described as a Kodak fiend. So Kodak cameras, little the little portable ones, the brownies or whatever they were called, those were brand new in the 1890s. And she's branded in the press as a Kodak fiend. That's funny. That's uh, like the young, cool kids today taking pictures and posting them everywhere. But hey, even I do that. Have you seen my Instagram? I'm crushing it. Twain planned on explaining that each sin committed brought a person one... This is great. Twain planned on explaining that each sin committed brought a person one step closer to perfection. The more crimes you commit, the richer you become morally. Hey, let's read that one again. The more crimes you commit the richer you become morally. That's hilarious. Greetings, mate. And now Mark Twain is in Australia. He took the long sea voyage uh, from Vancouver to Sydney with a little stop in Hawaii, which he couldn't get to. Twain found Australians more like Americans than Englishmen. No shyness, get acquainted in five minutes, he wrote in his notebook. Twain, Livy, and Clara walked down the gangplank and headed via carriage the short distance to the city's finest hotel, the Australia, on Castlereagh Street. God, I got to find that the next time I go to Australia. Uh, the man from the Melbourne Argus found Twain undersized and unimpressive physically. Intellectually, he is like many another humorist. He seems cast in a somewhat somber mold. The reporter from the Sydney Morning Herald seemed disappointed that Twain was not jolly and joking. Twain told him a bit defensively that no one was properly funny, who was not at times quite serious. They discussed humor, and Twain trotted out some famous views on the subject. Life has been defined as a tragedy for those who feel and a comedy for those who think. He maintained that humor must be anchored by something absolutely authentic or it would fall flat. Don't you remember what famous actor David Garrick said to a friend? You may fool the town in tragedy, but they won't stand any nonsense in comedy. Any pretender can cast up the whites of his eyes to the heavens and roll out his mock heroics. But the comedian must have the genuine ring in him. Otherwise, he couldn't be a comedian. Amen, Daddy. As they walked the streets, the pair saw Twain's bushy-browed face plastered on numerous billboards, touting first appearance in Australia of the greatest humorist of the century. He was not just the funniest man alive. He would have to live up to being billed as the funniest man for the past 100 years. Audience members who had enjoyed his books might have read written versions of all five stories he would tell. But for Twain, the difference between the written and spoken versions was like the difference between the lightning and the lightning bug. He despised author readings as a crime that troubled the world. <laughs> That's great. My author friend, Gilbert King, said the same thing. An author should never do a reading. That it's the kiss of death. 
that if you're an author and you write a book, you should just go talk to the people. Okay, this is um, Sydney. He destroys the Protestant hall. The large audience cheered again and again. He bathed in it for long minutes. The reviews the next day were almost universally positive, and the payday was monumental. He earned about $400, $12,000 in current dollars, for 90 minutes work at Protestant Hall, which came in at double his nightly average in America and exceeded his biggest American hall in Portland. Twain was finally reaping a big single night reward. He had two more sold out appearances scheduled for Sydney. Uh, so, yeah, people are trying to get him to comment on politics. Uh, when asked his opinion of the British Empire, he begged off, calling it a large subject for an infant to talk about. Every man has in his character weak places which he is ashamed of, said Twain. Fortunate men are like the moon. They never exhibit anything but their best side. Twain was quickly forgiven his offhand interview comments. The author, for better or worse, learned a profound lesson. He was traveling the globe to sell tickets for his performances. He could save his opinions on colonialism, imperialism, class warfare, British arrogance, decimation of native peoples, and sundry other outrages for his private notebook and his travel book to appear a year or two later. So yeah, he'd, uh, um, he'd been offered all this money to write newspaper articles in his, in his, in his journey, uh, and he took the money up front, and, and then he, he returned the money uh, after he decided it would be better to uh, reflect while he's traveling and write at his leisure uh, and accumulate the writings for another travel book instead of um, to have to hit all these newspaper deadlines um, in his journeys. <clears throat> so wherever he goes now in Australia uh, and further in this world tour, he gets invited to all these, like, there's all these proper rich guy clubs uh, where notable authors and powerful politicians and stuff hang out. So on Saturday night after the show, he went to an 85-person dinner in his honor thrown at the Cathedral Hotel by the Yorick Club an association of leading literary and government men. After acknowledging his princely welcome, as thoroughly deserved, he veered to politics and kinship. Let one of us be far away from his country, be it Australia or England or America or Canada, and let him see either the English flag or the American flag, and I defy him not to be stirred by it. The crowd cheers. Oh yes, blood is thicker than water, and we are all related. If we do jaw and ball at each other now and again, that is no matter at all. Laughter. We do belong together, and we are parts of a great whole. The greatest whole that this world has ever seen. The whole that, someday, will spread over this world, and I hope, annihilate and abolish all other communities. Loud cheers and laughter. It will be the survival of the fittest. The English is the greatest race that ever was, or will prove itself so before it gets done, and I would like to be there to see it. Laughter. <laughs> okay. Are you enjoying this book? I sure am. We haven't even gotten to the naked... Um, Natives yet. Okay, where are we? By contrast, he was also amazed at the piousness of the Australian colonies. Packed with churches and various denom denominations, 
and willing to sacrifice their pleasures on Sunday, their only day off. He noted that newspapers were forbidden to publish Sunday editions and that streetcars didn't run before noon on Sunday. Most colonies forbade entertainments on Sundays, such as a Twain performance or the circus or plays. Many communities ordered saloons closed. He jotted down that he thought the pulpit feared the competition. The two Australian passions are racing and keeping the Sabbath, he wrote in his notebook. Twain was also surprised to learn that Australians use the word native to mean a white person born in Australia, while they use aboriginal or black fellow to characterize the tribal people living there. Twain had not seen a single dark-skinned aboriginal during his three-week stay. Estimates vary, but the aboriginal population had dropped to less than 100,000 by 1895. <clears throat> Um, Sir Walter Scott was, an, was the English write, writer who wrote Ivanhoe. I highlighted this. So he lived from 1771 to 1832. Author of Ivanhoe and other historical novels. Owned the publishing house Ballantyne, which failed during a financial crisis in 1825. Scott refused to declare bankruptcy placed his home and income in the trust of his creditors, and spent the last seven years of his life grinding out books to repay his debts. Twain believed the man literally wrote himself to death. Scott refused any charity, including from the King of England. His novels continued to sell posthumously, and soon after his debt, death, his debts were paid. So um, that must have been something that Twain kept in mind and scared the shit out of him, that he would have to write until... Because this whole trip, I mean, he's having fun and everything, but um, bouts of depression, he had a terrible, moody bastard, and he would go into these um, anger fits and yell at people, and so he would... It was a big pendulum swing from charming, lovable humorist to... Uh, cranky old asshole and also so he's got this this burden of this uh of this debt and the humiliation of bankruptcy that was in all the newspapers and um that must have um been his greatest fear that he would have to write to pay off the rest of his debts and not do it out of pleasure uh, and, okay so now he arrives in new zealand no celebrity can be more readily approached than Mark Twain, the kindliest of smiles and of laughing, good-natured gray eyes make you immediately welcome. You are made to feel at once that you are in presence of a man whom fame or f fortune could not deprive of his natural disposition to make you laugh away the worries and troubles of the moment. He was, needless to say, a favorite with everybody on board. So that's on the ship, apparently, to New Zealand. New Zealand in 1895 was a shocking place. Women could vote. American women wouldn't win the vote until 1920. French women, not until 1944. Saudi Arabian women, not until 2015. New Zealand, followed by Australia, stands as the first in the modern world to allow women the right to vote. New Zealand, unlike parts of Australia, hadn't started as a penal colony. It had followed the more traditional pattern of befriending the dark-skinned locals and then battling them. The Maori proved worthy adversaries during a quarter century of fierce conflict. The victorious whites would eventually borrow place names from the conquered and enshrine their artifacts in museums. The living, breathing Maori of 1895, however, were mostly being squeezed onto ever-shrinking properties to the north. Uh, so this is again from Clara's diary. Um, 
Daughter Clara faithfully attended most of the lectures on the trip and observed closely. And she is the one who wrote down the exact words of the closing and the delivery. That was this horse story that he tell, told. Father knew the full value of a pause and had the courage to make a long one when required for a big effect. In his inimitable drawing speech, which he often lost in private life, greatly increased the humorous effect on the stage. People in the house, including men, got hysterical. Cries that resembled cries of pain could often be heard. Wow, so they're howling so hard it sounds like they're in pain. Uh, that's interesting, his drawling speech uh, he didn't always have in private life. Wow, what do you know? I can relate to that. She said her father always claimed to detest mounting the platform to deliver paid lectures, but even he wasn't immune to a theater full of people laughing and cheering. I believe that he was often elated by it himself, she later wrote, and on some nights when a big audience was roaring, she thought his cheeks and eyes glowed with color that resembled tinted sparks. So he's killing it in um, in New Zealand. He killed it in Australia. I think he's probably feeling a little better about himself. Somebody in, uh, in New Zealand gave him a stuffed platypus. Uh, and this, his wife wrote this in a letter to somebody. Mr. Clemens does not allow the stuffed platypus to leave his arms while we are moving from boat to train and train to boat. He says it is his most treasured possession. He does not think even his Maori wife beater stick surpasses it. Well, nobody told me about the Maori wife beater stick. I guess they got rid of that. Now, it's funny that they were the first to allow women the right to vote, and they're passing out Maori wife beater sticks to uh, visitors to New Zealand in 1895. But hey, in the modern era, let's not pass judgment on the past, right? With their New Zealand stay winding down up here on North Island, all three Clemens family members tried to soak up as much Maori culture as possible. The Maoris fascinated them. In the American West, they had seen almost no Indians. In Australia, they had seen no Aborigines. That's what it says, Aborigines. In Tasmania, the natives had died out two decades before their arrival, but now this North Island of New Zealand provided their first chance to closely observe an exotic culture, a culture without long pants or neck-to-ankle dresses or lace-up shoes. Remember, women's fashions of 1895 were um, rather uncomfortable and puritanical, to say the least. When they arrived in Wanganui, Twain wrote plenty Maoris here, plenty horseback riding, plenty comely girls in cool and pretty summer gowns. The Maori women wore tight, bright colored cloth wraps and many of them sported geometric tattoos on their chins and lips that from a distance resembled goatees. The author learned that the word they used for white man or foreigner was pakaha, which was derived from the Maori word paka, pakaha for magical creature or fairy. When the white man came, they took him for a kind of fairy because of his complexion. Before Twain left the Waganui region, he found himself profoundly disgusted by a monument in the heart of the Maori land built by whites to celebrate the heroism of 20 Maori warriors who died fighting for whites. He deemed it a monument to traitors, disloyal to their own families and people, and thought it could be fixed only with dynamite. He saved these thoughts for his travel memoir. Well, oh, 
Sounds like um, some feelings I've had when I've traveled. Okay, so now they're on the boat to India. And Twain writes in his notebook, The porpoise is the clown of the sea, he wrote in his notebook. Evidently, he does his wild antics for pure fun. There is no sordid profit in it. Sometimes all roads lead back to the, his forced tour. He created another maxim, give and take, especially the latter. Okay, where are they now? Oh, Ceylon. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the, the places that this guy traveled in this time period, nobody got to go to these places. Um, so, okay, so where is he? Okay, so he arrives in India. He was determined to go sightseeing. He asked a reporter and a major he had met to take him to see the sights. And they took him with that wild beauty and life all about to the new post office, a Victorian building that could have been in London. This elicited in his notebook the sentence that it, was, it, it proved the incurable stupidity of man. Twain bailed on that duo and instead joined his wife and daughter for an excursion. They climbed aboard rickshaws and were hauled to the crowded market at Cinnamon Square and along the seaside esplanade at Gal Face. Twain harbored mixed feelings towards human-drawn vehicles. He makes good speed for half an hour, but it is hard work for him. He is too slight for it. After the half hour, there is no more pleasure for you. Your attention is all on the man, just as it would be on a tired horse. So they're in Ceylon. C-E-Y-L-O-N? How would you pronounce it? Ceylon, that teardrop island at the triangular tip of India. The most amazing varieties of nakedness and color. This is Mark Twain's words. The most amazing varieties of nakedness and color. And all harmonious and fascinating. Ingredients, a shining black body, nine-tenths naked, and one or two bright-colored rags, and you have... The perfection of dress, grace, comeliness, convenience, comfort, beauty. He later buffed up his enthusiasm when writing his travel book. What a dream Ceylon was of tropical splendors of bloom and blossom and oriental conflagrations of costume. The walking groups of men, women, boys, girls, babies, each individual was a flame, each group a house, a fire for color. And such stunning colors, such intensely vivid colors, such rich and exquisite minglings and fusings of rainbows and lighting, lightnings. Sometimes a woman's whole dress was but a scarf wound about her person and her head. Sometimes a man was but a turban and a careless rag or two. In both cases, generous areas of polished dark skin showing but always the arrangement compelled the homage of the eye and made the heart sing for gladness. All right. You never got to see anybody naked in 1890s North America and Europe. Okay, Bombay. It seems surprising, verging on incredible, that this petulant performer, this grouchy, exhausted traveler could fall in love with any place at that point in his life. But the American author found himself mesmerized by the eclectic, brazen color charged chaos of India, of ashes splashed naked holy men, of cinnamon tinted women twirled in gaudy gauze, of cows, of cows ruling corners, of monkeys enshrined in temples, of corpses devoured by vultures, of fakers running freak shows, of jeweled maharajis, maharajas aboard even more bejeweled elephants, 
of harems ported in swaying palanquins, of the stately Taj Mahal and the holy river Ganges. Twain's fascination with India was no more literary pose. Twain's fascination with India was no literary pose. His uncharacteristically gushing observations spill off the pages of his private notebooks and into letters and then onto the pages of his later travel book. He never outgrew a sort of child's delight in encountering the exotic, the circus, rafting pirates. He kept his keen pleasure at running smack into something never expected to turn up in Hannibal, Missouri. Years later, he would call India the only foreign land, land I ever daydream about or deeply long to see again. That means India outranked England, France, Italy, Germany, Austria, Sweden, Switzerland, Egypt, the Holy Land, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, to name some places that the author visited. Father seemed like a young boy in his enthusiasm over everything he saw, wrote Clara of their stay in India. He kept reiterating, this wonderful land, this marvelous land, there can be no other like it. India didn't discover Twain. Twain discovered India. Right. Uh, he had a guide named Gandhi, which some biographies said was the Mahatma Gandhi, but it was just another dude named Gandhi. Twain saw a swastika, not yet borrowed by the Nazis, and asked about it. Gandhi explained that the main symbol for John Jane philosophy, representing the four levels of existence, demon, animal, including insects and plants, human and heavenly. Jainism, espousing a fully vegan, nonviolent life, ranks as one of the world's oldest surviving religions. Twain noticed portraits of holy men in a chapel. The man, Gandhi, who had been to Chicago, explained, you have also your demigods, like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and others. And while you place statues of such great men in parks and public places, we place them in temples and sanctuaries. Interesting. Twain recorded arriving on February 4th, 1896 at the fag end and finish of the great January melee when natives swarm to Allah. Allahabad to bathe in the sacred waters. He said sick pilgrims came to be healed or die, and many hundreds of thousands walked hundreds of miles to get there from all over India to be cleansed of sin. He marveled at the faith and devotion which were beyond imagination to our kind of people, the cold whites. Wow. He marveled at the faith and the devotion, which were beyond imagination to our kind of people, the cold whites. Wow. Twain's disgust with all organized religions mounted year by year until his late in life rants about Christianity, especially its sought after heaven that featured such dull entertainment as harps, Choirs and prayers. <laughs> the guidebook writer himself, the Reverend Arthur Parker of the London Missionary Society, took them around. He might have conveyed a certain bias since he considered Hinduism to be ignorant folly. As they walked aboard boats for the classical tour along the Ganges to see the pilgrim bathers and cremations, they got a sense of the ancient, crumbling, mesmerizing holy town where Buddha once preached. Where Buddha once preached. Residents, Reverend Parker pointed out that one out of eight of 20, 222,000 residents was a priest. Religion, then, is the business of Benares. 
just as gold production is the business of Johannesburg, interpreted Twain, who judged the place a kind of humongous department store because it was the theologically stacked. Theologically stocked. Okay, maybe it's time for a sip of water. Ah, have you tried water lately? It's pretty delicious. Especially when you're reading a book you love to friends. I... Uh, Okay, so I guess he writes this, I guess he, <clears throat> in, the, in his travel book, he ends up writing this and pissed off a lot of <clears throat> Hindu people. Where Twain really earned the wrath of the faithful Hindus was in, his, was in his later riff on reincarnation and the risks of dying on the wrong side of the Ganges. The Hindu has a childish and unreasoning aversion to being turned into an ass, a donkey. It is hard to tell why. One could properly expect an ass to have an aversion to being turned into a Hindu. One could understand that he could lose dignity by it. Also, self-respect and nine-tenths of his intelligence. But the Hindu, changed into an ass, wouldn't lose anything unless you count his religion, and he would gain much, released from his slavery to two million gods and 20 million priests, fakers, holy merchants, and other sacred bacali. Bacali? He would escape the Hindu hell. He would also escape the Hindu heaven. These are advantages which the Hindu ought to consider. Then he would go over and die on the other side. Well, I could see why that would piss people off. He's basically calling them all morons for believing what they believe in. There's Twain in a nutshell, playful on both sides of the topic, awed and amused at the same time. Carlyle Smythe's line about him holds, a sedate savant who has been seduced from the paths of high seriousness by a fatal sense of the ridiculous. Hmm? Okay. It means he's wacky. In his notebook, Twain claimed he had heard that although various Christian missionaries had achieved little success converting Hindus, they had scored some breakthroughs with monkeys. In two years, at a cost of $60,000, four monkeys had been converted, and 11 of them, 11 monkeys... Uh, are hopefully interested. <laughs> this guy is a stitch. For a man who has gone down in history as an ardent anti-imperialist, Twain gave the British a pass on its snatching and governing of India. In interviews over this, this stretch, he quite praised the Raj. He told the reporter for the Calcutta Englishman, when one considers the security and prosperity, one cannot help coming to the conclusion that the British government is the best for India. Whether the Hindus or Mohammedans, Muslims, like it or not, he continued, unless he was misquoted, by asserting that the British race was physically and intellectually superior to the Indian race. The British race is vigorous, prolific, and enterprising. Above all, it is composed of merciful people, the best kind of people for colonizing the globe. Interesting. Yeah, because it's uh, he's very anti-colonialism, uh, pro-native, but uh, he is going to all these high society dinners of all these rich English nobleman while he's in India, so maybe he didn't want to uh, offend the Yorkshire pudding servers. Um, okay, so he goes to the Himalayas near Tibet with the, the contacts that he made in India from the British Railway and all these other people. He gets to go on these private hand cars um up into the Himalayas in this, this new track 
near the, um, the, the, the Darjeeling Himalayan Express, which was the highlight of his trip. Of all the races living abroad, the English adapt themselves the least to foreign cultures. Groust André Chevrillon. They defy assimilation of any sort and recreate home while abroad. Well, I know that. I've traveled with um, several English comedians in Asia. Do you have any H.P. Brown sauce? It's a Thai restaurant, bro. Yes, but it would be better if there was some H.P. Brown sauce. You've ordered French fries. You're not even trying the food. Can I have some H.P. Brown sauce, please? Okay. One day we'll make that funny. <laughs> to the listeners in English, in England, there's nothing wrong with H.P. Brown sauce. But not on every fucking meal. Okay. Indian historian Keshav Mutalik, who celebrated Twain's writing and was thrilled that Twain loved India, was absolutely baffled by Twain's blindness to the oppressions and humiliations of British rule. The English East India Company, arguably the most successful private company, controlled India for more than a century until 1858 and had already weathered a handful of mutinies by the dark-skinned sepoy troops. In 1764, the British had famously struck down a mutiny, tied 24 ringleaders to the mouths of cannons and blew them up, scattering their chances for reincarnation. Wow. Guess uh, H.P. Brown sauce isn't going to fix that, is it? Over that hundred years, the vast wealth of the subcontinent showered down upon a handful of lordly British stockholders. The crown profited by taxing the company and and often borrowing huge sums from it. The company controlled India by directly conquering the land and also through alliances with native states to speed up the swallowing of all of India. Lord Dalhousie of the company created convenient policy the doctrine of lapse, stipulating that if an Indian state lacked a legitimate male heir or was mismanaged, the company would take over that province and its treasury of gold and silver and all its lands. Lapse was in the eye of the beholder. Like the eye of Lord Dalhousie, the governor general. The company confiscated 30 kingdoms, including, in 1854, a very wealthy, proud one, Oud, which included Lucknow and bordered Kanpuri. And this inflamed the locals. Even Murray's quite pro-British guidebook conceded that this appeared like a policy of unjust and high-handed aggression. Another spark to the Indian mutiny was that the British army supplied its Muslim and Hindu troops with new Enfield rifles, with cartridges, unfortunately greased with hog or cow fat, that had to be bitten during the loading process. It was a master stroke of insensitivity to both religions. Nasty shit. There is room enough here for all adventurous heroism and indefatigable perseverance that ever made the name of England great. A French traveler in Twain's time put it slightly different. The English see the Hindu only as a boy who is good to carry his bags and shine his shoes. Just as they see in the countryside an agriculture or industrial business opportunity. And Mohammed Aga Khan, descendant of the Prophet, leader of the Ismailis, and a Anglophile, found the atmosphere poisoned between the races in India in the mid-1890s. 
The color barrier had to be kept rigid and absolute, or some mysterious process of contamination would set in. And their faith in their own superiority and in their right, their moral, intellectual, and biological right to rule others would be sapped. The next speaking stop was only 45 miles away, but travel was often not easy in those days. The Twain entourage had to board a train at 3.30 a.m. to reach Agra and the Taj Mahal, a Persian Muslim masterpiece built for a favorite harem wife who died during her 14th pregnancy. It's a tad ironic that predominantly Hindu India's most famous building is a Muslim mausoleum with lines of the Quran on some walls, a shrine to Mumtaz Mahal, the dead wife of one one of India's Mughal conquerors, Shah Jahan. His name in Persian means ruler of the world. A devout Muslim, he was rather intolerant of Hindus. Twain and his family saw the marvel by day, also by night, from close, from afar. Twain even stated in his notebook that he saw the Taj at midnight during an eclipse of a full moon. At that moment, to our surprise, an eclipse began, and in an hour was total. An attention not before offered to a stranger since the Taj was built. Attempts were made to furnish an eclipse for the Prince of Wales in 1876 and in recent years to two other princes of that house, but without success. However, Colonel Locke, political agent, has much more influence than any of his predecessors have had. It appears that Twain was just trying out that gag because the eclipse never made it into his travel book, just as viewing by straight moonlight just a viewing by straight moonlight. The author was clearly feeling the pressure of writing about the sublime Taj. Guidebook writers have emptied dictionaries, combing for new adjectives to capture the exquisite beauty and harmony of the 1647 tomb to a Shah's soulmate. He built for her the most splendid mausoleum that the world has known and dedicated it to the memory of an undying love. And truly, everything that is lovely in love seems to have found form and shape in that wondrous structure. Okay, it's funny, after I read that, I said to Ashna, hey, did you know that the Taj Mahal was built for um, his favorite harem wife? I thought it was his wife. And she goes, oh yeah, everybody knew that. Everybody but me. And now you know as well. Okay, where are they at now? The insecurities of God. Twain deemed it pathetic that God, in all major religions, demands constant praise. We make fun of poor little vain girls who fish for compliments. It's a good point. Why is God so insecure? He's all powerful and shit. When we enter, oh, okay. So they're in South Africa now. So he gets into a kerfuffle. It's amazing the people that he met in his lifetime. You know, he met Rudyard Kipling, uh, Cecil Rhodes, who ran South Africa, united the Diamond families. Uh, The Boer War, the Boers were, dis- were the, descend- the descendants of the Dutch who stayed in South Africa. And then the English come in, and Cecil Rhodes is making all this money. Uh, you know, the, the British crown is taxing it. But they're having these wars, the Boer War, so that England can snatch up um, control of South Africa. And these guys had this... Twain wrote shit about Cecil Rhodes and then also these these English guys were captured and thrown into prison and Twain wrote about it and pissed everybody off and then he said in um, some interviews 
Mark Twain said that the food and the accommodations, this is at the prison, were fully equal to the Waldorf Astoria in New York. And if John Hayes Hammond knew what was good for him, he would ask for a life sentence. A storm of indignation swept over South Africa, and our situation was not improved. Since then, I have failed to find anything funny in anything Mark Twain says or does. So I think that was Cecil Rhodes himself. No relation. Talking of patriotism, what humbug it is. It is a word which always commemorates a robbery. There isn't a foot of land in the world which doesn't represent the ousting and re-ousting of a long line of successive owners who each in turn, as patriots, with proud and swelling hearts, defended it against the next gang of robbers who came to steal it, and did, and became swelling hearted patriots in their turn. That's right. So he's in South Africa. Here he was traveling in the heart of perhaps the most racially divisive place on earth, a place that teased his memory to his childhood amid slavery in the Old South. He listened to the black women speaking near Bloom Fountain and heard the sweet, soft musical voice of blacks in America. I followed a couple of them a mile to listen to the music of their speech and the happy ripple of their laugh. So in, in South Africa, he drops the Huck, Twin, Huck Finn uh, runaway slave Jim story because um, I think he did it the first night in South Africa and it fell flat and people didn't like it and um, he wasn't a political crusader. He was a comic in debt. Um, the story most often he told in Africa was a ghost story told by a slave. Instead of celebrating the freeing of a slave, he was celebrating the art of a slave, the storytelling art. And this is from his notebook. On the platform, I used to tell a Negro ghost story that had a pause in front of the snapper on the end. And that pause was the most important thing in the whole story. If I got it the right length, precisely, I could spring the finishing ejaculation with effect enough to make some impressionable girl deliver a startled little yelp and jump out of her seat. And that was what I was after. It's unclear when exactly she took it. Okay, this is... Um, so Susie... Are they in back in... Where are they at now? All right, hang on. Susie's in trouble, everybody. Oh, Christ. Yeah. So it turns out that his, the daughter Susie, who stayed back in Elmira, um, you know, because she likes some guy, she's bored to death. She, she, she went to New York. You know, they're like I said, they, they had money, enough credit for them to do whatever they wanted, but um, probably could have saved Susie's life had she gone on this trip. She ended up, um, she got like meningitis. Or, okay, here we go. So, so they find out that she's in trouble. So um, Livy, Twain's wife, and the daughter Clara get on a ship to go back to the United States. And it's, you know, it's it's like uh, whatever. It takes a week or two to get back. And while Livy is crossing the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Susie dies. And this is, where are they? I think he's in, I think they're, they get back. Yeah, they're back in England because they're sending telegrams from Southampton. Okay, so... That Monday night and the following night, Twain and Smythe kidded around and played billiards. Twain was standing in the living room around midnight on Tuesday when the doorbell rang. A messenger delivered a succinct telegram from his brother-in-law. Susie could not stand brain congestion and meningitis 
and was peacefully released today. She died. Twain later wrote, It is one of the mysteries of our nature that a man, all unprepared, can receive a thunderstroke like that and live. He told no one in the house, as his authorized biographer put it. He had torn his family apart and set out on a weary pilgrimage to pay for long financial unwisdom, a heavy price, a penance in which all, without complaint, had joined. Now, just when it seemed about ended, when they were ready to unite and be happy once more, when he could hold up his head among his fellows, in this moment of supreme triumph had come the message that Susie's lovely and blameless life was ended. There are not many great dramas in fiction or in history than this. There are not many greater dramas in fiction or in history than this. Mark Twain's life had contained other tragedies, but no other that equaled this one. This time, none of the elements were lacking, not the smallest detail. The dead girl had been his heart's pride. It was a year since he had seen her face, and now by this word, he knew that he would never see it again. The blow had found him alone, absolutely al um, alone among strangers, those others halfway across the ocean, drawing nearer and nearer to it, and he with no way to warn them, to prepare them, to comfort them. Clara and Livy were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, four days from scheduled arrival in New York Harbor on Saturday, August 22nd, with no technological means to contact them. It is unclear when exactly she took a turn for the worse. She grew agitated and delirious. This is Susie, right before she died. She stalked up and down her room, muttering over and over, Go up the trolley. Go up the trolley cars for Mark Twain's daughter. Down go the... Up go the trolley cars for Mark Twain's daughter. Down go the trolley cars for Mark, Mark Twain's daughter. Wow, she was a raving lunatic at the end. Um, brain congestion? Meningitis? It's fucking nasty. The family buried Susie... Sunday, August 23rd. Death and burial notices ran in many newspapers. Livy and Clara both blamed her death on the evil influence of spiritualism. Livy bitterly wondered why no one in Hartford had reached out to her brother and sister in Elmira to come intervene. So I guess Susie's running around at seance parties and all that other shit that was hot in the 1890s. She believed that spiritual agitation had killed the frail girl. The Clemens family always believed that Susie's death could have been prevented. It's impossible to know how Susie contracted the disease, which is usually spread through exchange of saliva or eating contaminated food. Wow. So, they finished their tour in... England, and, you know, they go back, they bury Susie, and now they're completely shattered. So they go back to London, and they rent this place at 23 Tedworth Square. And they rented it in secret. They wore black. They bought morning stationery bordered in black. Livy refused all visitors, and the Clemens women rarely left the house. Everyone shattered. So they're living in this, uh, it's this tranquil part of Chelsea. The family lingered in bitterness over Susie's unnecessary death. They blamed their Hartford friends, such as the Warners, for not warning them. Livy refused to take comfort in letters from others who had lost children. She told her husband, they have lost a daughter, but they have not lost a Susie Clemens. It was a long time before anyone laughed in our household, wrote Clara. Father's passionate nature expressed itself in thunderous outbursts of bitterness, shading into rugged grief. 
There was no draw in his speech now. Wow. I know that. Crushing heartbreak. Many years later, Clara tried to reconstruct the sort of conversations that she overheard her mother and father having in those first months of grief. This is from her father, Mark Twain, yelling or telling the mother. Once the idea of that infernal trip to pay debts struck us, we couldn't shake it. Oh, no, for it was packed with sense, with a sense of honor, 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 no rest, comfort, joy, but plenty of honor, plenty of ethical glory. And as a reward for our self-castigation and faithfulness to ideals of nobility, we were robbed of our greatest treasure, our lovely Susie, in the midst of her blooming talents and personal graces. You want me to believe it is judicious, a charitable God that runs this world? Why, I could run it better myself. Whew. Ah, uh, shit, where are we? So he had made friends with, uh, I know it's getting late, people. We're getting closer to the end. Um, he became friends with, <clears throat> um, oh, sorry, that last part fucked me up. Uh, he became friends with Helen Keller uh, and helped her out, helped her get uh, funding for her education uh, there's another time in the future, I don't think I highlighted it, where back when he's living in New York that um, Winston Churchill, he, he introduces Winston Churchill. Anyway, Helen Keller said this about Mark Twain. Uh, she idolized Twain as a great writer, but she perceptively conceded that she occasionally found his outraged tirades, both the funny ones and the serious ones, a bit over the top. Sometimes it seemed as if he let loose all the artillery of heaven against an intruding mouse. The Clemens family ignored Christmas. Pious carolers might parade through the streets. Herods might stock the latest mechanical wind-up toys, but the family would have none of it. Susie's absence eclipsed all. I do not know that she, I did not know that she could go away and take our lives with her, yet leave our dull buddies behind. Fuck. That's how, uh, how it felt after my sister Laura died. So he writes this last travel book. Uh, and they ended up calling this one Following the Equator, which a lot of critics didn't think was as funny. Uh, but he said himself, I wrote my last travel book in hell, but I let on the best I could that it was an excursion through heaven. Twain would later confess to William Dean Howells, someday I will read it. And if it's lying cheerfulness fools me, then I shall believe it fooled the reader. Uh, this is one of the greatest Mark Twain quotes um, that, I, that has been taken by loads of people. Um, if Christ were here now, there is one thing he would not be, a Christian. Ain't that the truthus? Twain had decided to leave out any mention of visiting South Africa in his travel book. A successful book is not made of what is in it, but is what is left out of it. And that's that famous Miles Davis quote that I always love. He said, it's, it's not important the notes that you play, it's important the notes that you don't play. Um... Do, 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 nearing the end of a great book, yeah. Uh, wow, okay, so now, the joys of payback. Uh, with the, the money from the tour, money from the travel book, and then 
uh, I think the American publishing house worked it out with the Bliss company for him to put out a set of complete works. And um, now they've got money. And who says this? His wife writing the nephew who wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle or Examiner, I find your Uncle Sam looking well and seeming quite ha quite himself. He is cheerful and full of work and never more gentle and lovely. It is a joy to see him and hear him talk. This moment I hear him singing. Always a sweet sound. Um, so Twain was... So now he's, he's, he's back on his feet. They're... Uh, they can return to America finally. Because, uh, you know, it's in the, all the papers that, oh, it was it? Yeah, I'm just coming up. Twain was now cocky enough and concerned enough about his health and sanity to turn down Major Pond's offer of $50,000 for a 125-night U.S. tour. He fired off a telegram and then eased into a newspaper-free, kick-around writing project summer before heading off to Vienna for Clara's piano lessons. So instead of returning to the United States, they go move to Vienna because Clara wants to take piano lessons there. Uh, in, in Vienna, they, re they meet this long-haired, long-haired dreamy maniac who asked her father if the Clemens family would join him in Africa and help create a lofty example to the world, uh, to live on nuts, apples, and the love of God without raiments or noteworthy occupations. It was to be a utopian nudist colony in Africa. Twain puffed on his pipe, deliberated, and drawed the, that his misfortunes had not quite brought him to the point of living in the jungle. So, in Vienna, they move into the Hotel Metropole, where Twain negotiated a 40% discount for lodging, food, and maid service. That still left the family paying $460 per month which nearly equaled an American workman's average wages for a year. Uh, Sigmund Freud came to see him perform. Okay, now here's the happy, this is it. Okay. So he sent all his money back to his friend H.J.H. Rogers, who was one of the founding members of Standard Oil, he was one of the original robber barons. All these robber barons started these monopolies, uh, the railroads, oil, steel, uh, where they were basically, you know, monopolies that were uh, controlling America and crushing workers' rights. And Anyway, he was Mark Twain's best friend. So he sends back all this money, and... H.H. H. Rogers, through his uh, people he has working for him, they start mailing out. He, now Mark Twain has enough money. He's living in Vienna at this Metropole Hotel. Uh, and they start mailing out checks for the full amount. So There was like a, a trial settlement where some of the debts could be paid 50% of what was owed, but... Mark Twain's wife insisted on him paying all of it, most all of them in full. So what a happy day that must have been, where they get to send out all the checks to pay the money that he owed. The U.S. Postal Service delivered the checks for the final 25% payment, and the thank you notes started pouring into H.H.'s office. Astonishment and amazement on one business letterhead after another, doesn't begin to capture it. A bankrupted author was repaying in full his 1898, a debt, was repaying in full in 1898, 
a debt stemming from the business crash of 1893. Goodness knows, we, have, we would have signed a receipt at any time if the receipt had been sent to us whether the money was or not. We cannot tell you how much admiration we have for Mr. Clemens in undertaking to liquidate the obligations of his unfortunate firm. Kindly say to him, for us, that he is a credit to his country, and we dare say he will be used as an example to American youth of all time to come, of clear grit and thorough honesty. These are the thank you letters that were coming in. We were deeply grieved when his hard times came and were only too happy to do what we could at the time in relieving him of further obligation to us. He has really only done what we always knew he would do, but in accomplishing it has added tenfold to his past reputation for integrity and has given the world an example which shows the high honor of an American gentleman. Livy and Twain and the whole family sat in their ornate rooms in Vienna and read and reread the creditor's letters. I am as, as cheerful as anybody now. I have got my self-respect back, Twain wrote. He was so happy when all the, them debts was paid, later recalled housemaid Katie Leary, that he said he felt just like a boy again, free and out of school. Twain wrote to H.H., Mrs. Clemens has been reading the creditor's letters over and over again and thanks you deeply for sending them and says this is the only really happy day she has had since Susie died. So, okay, so Mark Twain is, is, is out of debt, right? He finally has some money to breathe again. Uh, so what do you think he's going to do now? Fall for more stupid investments. Of course, you guessed it. Um, this guy comes to him with this idea about printing photos on fabrics that's going to revolutionize the, the fabric industry. And he falls for it. And over like a five-week period, he starts bombarding his buddy H.H. H. Rogers with... Um, with letters telling him to invest in it. And then another thing, <clears throat> then finally he gets rid of that. And then someone invents condensed milk. And Mark Twain, who had a lot of illnesses, especially on this trip, he had gout. I mean, you know, the guy's drinking and smoking cigars and eating fatty meals every night of his life. Uh, he believed that condensed milk was like this cure-all drug. And he kept it with him at all time. And he bought the rights for England for condensed milk and then part of the rights for America. And he's trying to get every wealthy friend he can to invest in this condensed milk. And he's saying it, it's the cure-all for everything. For arthritis, cures arthritis, cures gout. And it's just so funny. And then he ends up investing a bunch of money in it, uh, which doesn't get him any money back. Um, but it's just funny to think of somebody in 1898, 1899, sitting there thinking that condensed milk was this cure-all miracle um, drug when it's condensed fucking milk. Yeah, okay, thanks, pal. So, um, yeah, the first thing he wants to do when he gets some money again is invest in more stupid shit that's not going to work. Uh, Vienna proved immensely hospitable to the legendary American writer. The Austrian newspapers repeatedly referred to him as our famous guest. Stephen Crane, passing through, grouchily called him a society clown. Um... So, he wrote an article defending Jewish people uh, called Concerning the Jews. Uh, defending the Chosen People, 
while acknowledging their talent for money making. Um, and there was nobody sticking up for Jewish people back then. Um, let's read it. Should we? Yeah, what the hell? He captured the ethnic hatreds of this Eastern European empire, larger than France or Germany, whose government had encouraged anti-Semitism to distract the various other ethnicities, Serbs, Croats, Czechs, Hungarians, from killing each other. In all cases, the Jew had to roast, wrote Twain, in what cultural historians consider one of the first pieces on forces leading to the rise of the Nazi movement. That Jew-roasting observation sparked controversy and led Twain to clarify his views on Jews and Harpers the following year. He argued, provocatively, that it was the Jew's honesty that infuriated people, not his cheating, and that the hatred stemmed from simple jealousy of wealth. He did lambast Jews for shirking military duty, abandoning Dreyfus, and dominating world commerce. He expected both Jew, he, he expected both Christian and Jew to hate this peace. Twain, however, confessed in a letter to H. H. Rogers a certain bias in favor of Jews. He almost took that view a step further, but then crossed out the following lines. There is one thing I'd like to say, but I doesn't. Christianity has deluged the world with blood and tears. Judaism has caused neither for religion's sake. Vienna was wunderbar and, was, and so was hobnobbing with the Habsburgs. But the author, with his debts paid, now began to weigh returning to the United States. Livy dashed that thought demanding that the family stay together in Europe for Clara's musical training and secretly for Jean's cure. They had not shared Jean's illness with anyone outside the family circle. Twain explained, not entirely convincingly, to H.H., I robbed the family to feed my speculations, and so I am willing to accommodate myself to their preferences. So, uh, there's this... All these doctors were say, claiming they could cure epilepsy, and there was some place in Sweden that they end up going to. Um, first, they, did they go to Switzerland? It's it's funny that Mark Payne, Twain, in this time, penned a dirty poem uh, that was a parody of <clears throat> of this uh, Rubiat the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. I have a copy of that book. Um, and in the dirty poem, he writes, Behold, the penis is mightier than the sword that leapt from sheath at any heeding word. So long ago is peaceful now and calm and dreams unmoved of ancient conquests scored. Anyway, he decided not to publish it. Um... And then his friend H.H. H. Rogers is buying up all this steel stock. And he takes some of Mark Twain's money and he earns him an investment. Uh, I'm sorry, a profit. In a month, Rogers sold the steel stock for a solid 33% profit of $5,750. He then timed buying back in and purchased a fresh 712 shares of Federal Steel Common Stock at 32 which after only a week, just as Christmas approached, showed a 44% paper profit of $10,000 on Twain's $22,889. He asked Twain whether to sell. Twain cabled back just after New Year's. Follow your judgment, whatever it is. I take the risk. Clemens. Rogers held on to it. So his buddy, his rich friend is now making him some money on top of everything else. Uh, the family left Vienna, May 26th, 1899. Uh, like I said, Freud went to see him perform. 
Uh, the family left Vienna on May 26, 1899. 27 high-born well worshipers overfilled their railroad carriage with bouquets of roses and forget-me-nots. The little Countess Bardi wept. Twain accepted his wife's suggestion to squeeze in a visit en route to London to the estate of the great bohemian nobleman, Prince von Thurn und Taxis. As the horse-drawn rig carried them from the station, Livy tucked her feet into the fur foot muff. All along the way, the peasantry lifted their hats to us, that, of course, being because we were in the prince's carriage, wrote Livy to her sister. They drank tea at the fireside, and the noble couple and their son recited Twain to Twain, teasing him. Don't you remember? Okay, so... Uh, then they go to Sweden for this supposed cure of Jean's epilepsy. Uh, and then another turn in their good fortune was uh, Livy's brother did something with the company where they or she started making some money. So now they're set for life. And debt-free and an international celebrity from all that far-flung coverage, Mark Twain, after five years abroad, was finally heading home to America. On October 6, 1900, he, Livy, Clara, Jean, and Katie boarded the SS Minnehaha. So the ship docked at the West Houston Street Pier on the Hudson River at 9 p.m. on Monday, October 15th. Twain, the showman, let the riffraff exit first, and then he ambled down the gangplank into a swarm of reporters representing almost a d two dozen newspapers, including Pulitzer's New, New York World, Hearst's New York Journal, Reed's New York Tribune, Bennett's New York Herald, Oak's Rejuvenated New York Times. Each of the reporters wanted to honor, wanted the honor of shaking Twain's hand. Their reverential, near idolatrous coverage of the return of the bravest author in all literature would be picked up by newspapers all across the country, from the Salt Lake Tribune to the Portland Oregonian to Baltimore's German language paper Der Duscht Correspondent. Now he returns, his labors ended, and his object accomplished, free from debt and thoroughly a happy man. The American man with a conscience is not yet an extinct type. Okay, so now um, they buy a very nice home in New York City. So everything should be great and happy, right? A uh, happy ending? Uh, Clemens is here, settled down for the winter in West 10th Street and looking younger and jollier than I've seen him for 10 years. He says it is all plasmin. Plasmin is that um, uh, condensed milk shit. That was the name of it. A new German food drug, condensed milk. He's been talk. he's been taking, but I think it's partly prosperity. He has distinctly the air of a man who unloaded. Okay, here we go. So this is what happens. And this is the end of the book. Uh, invitations fluttered in, but often not for awkward Jean. Mama Livy made every effort to have the girl included. When I left here about 10 and walking to 4th Avenue, took a car, went up towards Union and Madison Squares through packs and jams of noisy men and women. Nearly everyone had a tin horn, which they were blowing loudly in each other's ears. It was perfectly horrible. Um, so he's being toasted all over the city. He's going to all these clubs. Um... Clara's got many male admirers, 
All the debts are paid. Uh, but nobody really wants anything to do with Jean, the youngest daughter. Um, oh, hang on. We hail him as the possessor of the quaint and peculiar genius which has discovered unsuspected possibilities of language and of thought, whose works have always commanded the widest audience and been received the world over with unbounded applause. Uh, Twain kept his speech relatively short. Seven years ago, when I was your guest here, when I was old and despondent, you gave me the grip and the word that lift a man up and make him glad to be alive. And now I come back from my exile, young again, fresh and alive, and ready to begin life once more. And your welcome puts the finishing touch upon my restored youth and makes it real to me, and not a gracious dream that must vanish with the morning. I thank you. Then he goes to Carnegie Hall for a piano recital, and he sits in somebody's booth. Um, the applause was like a tornado, wrote Jean. Uh, they went crazy for Mark Twain when he walks in just to go watch this recital. Uh, da -da -do -do. Uh, bloviated. There's a great word. Oh, so then he goes to this one... Oh, this is funny. He goes to Princeton, and, the, and <clears throat> football is a brand new thing, and college football is, is the number one thing. So um, he decides to return in a couple days to watch this Yale-Princeton football game, which he was never into athletics or anything like that. Uh, and then he, he said that Yale team could lick a Spanish army. They, they beat Yale 29 to 5. And it was a very violent game. And uh, he said to someone around him, this beats croquet. A few days later, the 19th Century Club invited him to a dinner at Sherry's. A pair of long-winded speakers bloviated on the disappearance of literature never once mentioning Twain's works, yea or nay. They predicted few current books would survive as long as Sir Walter Scott's works or John Milton's. Their snobbery brought out a feisty side of Twain who dared them to place his work side by side with any classics and see which one sold more. Professor Winchester also said something about there being no modern epics like Paradise Lost. I guess he's right. He talked as if he was pretty familiar with that piece of literary work, and nobody would su suppose that he had never read it. I don't believe any of you have ever read Paradise Lost, and you don't want to. That's something you just want to take on trust. Um... He was flooded with invitations from the highest and grandest in town. You see, people was crazier about him than ever, and every magazine and newspaper in the world was after him to write for them. They'd pay him anything he wanted. Why, I heard that one time he was offered as much as a dollar a word from one magazine if he'd give them an article. Uh, Livy sends her servant up to the Hartford, Connecticut house, which they haven't sold yet, uh, to get, like, silverware. And then she arrives back at Grand Central Station at, uh, at 42nd Street, and this Irish taxi driver charged her $1.50 to drive her a mile and a half. That's $45 in today's dollars. Twain came out and argued that the fare sheet stated 50 cents the first mile and 25 cents each additional mile, which made it 75 cents. Twain paid him $1. The Nighthawk called him a damned old fool. Twain decided to press charges, and he instantly became a hero to workaday New Yorkers for standing up to a cabbie. Many of them were large men who charged according to whim. 
I am doing this just as any citizen who is worthy of the name of citizen should do. Soapbox Twain. The driver, 24-year-old William Beck, was fined and had his license suspended. A few days later, Beck came to Twain's home to plead for his job back. He he claimed he supported his large Irish family. Katie, the maid, didn't believe him, saying an Irishman could muddle anyone. But Twain accepted the apology and agreed, agreed to sign off on his reinstatement. Twain's mercy won him more favor. Okay, there you go. That night he would introduce young war, young war correspondent Winston Churchill at the Waldorf Astoria. And they disagreed on uh, the imperialist nature of the British Empire. Um, but... Twain was still a gentleman when he introduced him. Twain had chased the last laugh and had caught it. Ovations certainly awaited him during his final decade, but it would be pretty hard for anything to top these weeks of adulation when the American author came back home. So... Uh, this is the very, very end for you, my friend. Uh, the family tried Europe yet again. Yeah. Daughter Jean also went down on a downhill slide with brief respites for her seizures, her severe depression, and occasional violent temper. She tried to kill Katie Leary. That's the the maid that was with them forever. She tried to kill Katie Leary twice, and after her mother's death, was institutionalized. Twain lacked the patience to care for her. Awkward Jean envied her sister Clara's numerous admirers and her talents at both piano and voice. She had written in her brief diary, It is going to be my miserable lot never to really love and be loved. That would be too dreadful and would offer another fair reason for suicide. In 1909, Twain, now living in Reading, Connecticut, experimented with having Jean move back to live with him. The 29-year-old seemed to be thriving, happily preparing for the holiday season, decorating the tree, buying presents. She took a bath on Christmas Eve morning had a seizure, and died in the tub. Twain wrote bittersweet, fumbling words to Clara, then in Europe. You can't imagine what a darling she was these last two or three days, and how fine and good and sweet and noble and joyful, thank heaven. How intellectually brilliant. I had never been acquainted with Jean before. I recognized that. So Clara... Uh, despite putting on a good face for the public, avoid spending long stretches with her father. When she, she married this guy, Ossip, that she met, he was an internationally renowned pianist, Ossip Grabalowicz, however you pronounce it. She married Osip soon after, and Twain attended the wedding wearing his red gown with his honorary degree at Oxford, no doubt drawing attention away from the bride. She lived until the 1960s, almost outliving her only child, the troubled daughter Nina. Okay, wow. While Mark Twain's published writings turned darker for the last decade of his life, his mischievous in his private life did not disappear and his friendship with H.H. H. Rogers deepened. Uh, the tycoon bought an elegant 227-foot steam yacht that rivaled J.P. Morgan's Corsair and he took the gray-haired boys, Twain, ex-speaker, Reed, Dr. Rice, Gadabout Hutton, among others, for several long cruises, all male, full of alcohol, cards, and practical jokes. 
Uh, one year they went to Cuba in 1902. Um, they had a good time. Off Cuba, the yacht ran into a storm. Rogers loved teasing Twain, the riverboat pilot, about his seasickness. As Twain stood alone clutching the rail, heaving, as the ship plunged between the waves, Rogers sent a crewman who asked Mr. Clemens, Can I get you something? Yes, he replied in that draw. Yes, get me a little island. So... H.H. Uh, H. Rogers died um, where is it? There we go. On Wednesday, May 19th, 1909, Twain took the train alone from Connecticut to New York City. By minutes, he had missed a telegram sent from the home of H.H. H. Rogers. Clara then staying in Manhattan, met him at Grand Central Station and told him that his good friend had died early that morning. Reporters clustered around him. This is terrible, terrible, he said. I cannot talk about it. Deeply upset, he leaned heavily on his daughter and walked very slowly towards the exit. He rested a few minutes in the waiting room, trying to compose himself. That's amazing to think at Grand Central Station they had a waiting area where Twain had to tuck over and pull himself together. He's so upset. I mean, this guy H.H. H. Rogers saved him from from um, being destitute and uh, in the shame. He, he, he not only was a friend, he, he kept him from financial ruin and kept his copyrights to his works in order. Days later, Twain stood shoulder to shoulder with William Rockefeller and E.H. Harriman as pallbearers at Rogers' burial. The New York Times placed Rogers in the same sentence with John D. Rockefeller, crediting him with creating Standard Oil. Mark Twain, Samuel Longhorn Clemens, died 11 months later on April 21, 1910, at age 74. Front page obituaries around the world hailed his, hailed his meteoric career as a humorist, as a novel, and as a world traveling public speaker who had paid his debts. His words and sayings echoed that week and would continue to echo. Twain left an estate valued the following year at a hefty $471,000. Placing him among the top one or two percent of wealthiest Americans. That sum equals about fifteen million dollars today. In his will, written in 1909, he bequeathed his entire fortune to his two daughters, but only Clara was alive to claim it. Tucked away in the legal documents was Twain's final comment on his financial misadventures. He stipulated that the gift to his daughter be free from any control or interference on the part of any husband she may have. Wow, that's it. Boom! It feels so good to read a book and close that final page. Um, that is Chasing the Last Laugh, uh, this fabulous book written by Richard Marx on the World Comedy Tour by Mark Twain. I hope you feel smarter, and, uh, and thank you, Mark Twain, for, uh, for all of the brilliant sentences and laughter that you brought to the world. It's amazing to think of him traveling the world and, and having all these great adventures. Um, the man is my hero, and uh, that's... Today's episode of Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. What can we say? On to Gallup. On to San Antonio. It was in Phoenix, yeah. I was on the radio. Ha 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 ha. 
<laughs> Abilene. Shalom, amigos. E amigas.
One more time, if you want to give and support us or donate, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, Patreon dot com forward slash Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. And if you want to enrich your life with wisdom and laughter, you can buy my brand new album, All Hail Laughter, on iTunes and Amazon. It's a double album, and it will certainly enrich your life with laughter. Enjoy.